Hi. I'm American. <laughs> but I've lived here in the Czech Republic since 1995. Wow, it's been a long time. Um, but now I have a Czech husband and a son, and I think I have a unique position in this society as both an insider and an outsider. I've been observing you for over 18 years, and there are some things that I would like to share about my observations. Being normal seems to be really, really important to you, Czechs. <laughs> Stay normalny? <laughs> Are you normal? Buch normalny. Be normal. I hear these phrases a lot. And every time I hear it, I think, what does that mean? You know, how should I act normal? Because I'm sure that my normal is much different than your normal. We all have our own idea of what is normal. But I think that we could probably say that within the greater Czech society, with the masses, all of us here today are probably not normal. Because we're spending a Saturday all day listening to presentations. My Czech mother-in-law would say that is not normal. <laughs> but I think all of us belong to little groups within this society. And within these little groups, we have our idea of what is normal. And it's important to us in these groups that we are normal. So if you think about these groups that we belong to, this normal tells us how we should dress. It tells us what kind of gadgets we should buy. It tells us how to act, how to think. I would like you to think about this in the context of some of these groups as examples. There's a geek group <laughs> or an alternative artistic group, or a banker group. It's no mystery that all of these different groups look similar. They look alike. Because this group is telling them what is normal. So I think that we could easily say that what normal is, in general, is being like everybody else. Okay? Normal is worrying about what other people think about you. Normal is trying to fit in. Normal is trying not to stand out. To me, this is a picture of hell. <laughs> I would like you to think about rejecting normal. But what is the opposite of normal? I don't think the opposite of normal is strange or weird or crazy. I think the opposite of normal is exceptional. And to me, exceptional means not caring what other people think about you. Going your own way, doing your own thing. Exceptional to me is standing out. And I think it makes for a much richer and much more interesting life. And I think there are just four changes that you can make starting today that can help you go on to the road to being exceptional. But before I tell you about those changes, I would like to make it very clear that I'm not standing up here saying, I am exceptional. I'm not. But all of these changes that I'm going to talk about are things that I'm working on myself, on the road to being exceptional. 
because while I may not be exceptional yet, I have certainly never been normal. Just ask my mother. <laughs> okay, change number one. I think that you don't talk to strangers enough. I know that talking to strangers is not normal. Definitely not. But you're missing out on a great opportunity here. I went to a Tuesday Business Network event about a year ago. And I went by myself, because I think that when you go by yourself to events, you can meet a lot of new people that you wouldn't if you went with a friend. And this event was called Communication Wednesday. And it was all about marketing. They had presenters and stuff. And I got there a little bit early, and there were a lot of people standing around, and the presenters hadn't started yet. And there was this networking opportunity, you know. And so I walk into the room, and here are all of these people standing by themselves, not talking to anybody else. And I walk in, and I'm thinking, OK, Communication Wednesday. <laughs> so I walk up to this one guy, and I said, well, it's Communication Wednesday. Let's communicate. I'm Gene. Hi. And it was like I had shocked him with an electrical shock. He was just, and he got over it after a while, and we had a nice conversation. But I looked around at all the other people, and I thought, why aren't they doing this, too? What is holding them back from this? Because we've all heard this phrase, it's not what you know, it's who you know. It's absolutely true. Unfortunately, it's usually talking about it in business sense. And I would like to forget about business right now. And I would like you to think about life, OK? I would like you right now to think about all of the people that you know right now, friends, relatives, acquaintances, all of these people that you know, think about them and think to yourself, are these the only people that I ever want to know for the rest of my life? I hope that you answer no. I hope that you say to yourself, maybe there are some interesting people out there that I haven't met yet. In order to meet those interesting people, you have to talk to strangers. I'm sorry, you just have to do it. So I think what, what is usually holding people back from talking to strangers, from meeting people, from networking, is the fear of rejection. We're all afraid that we're going to walk up to somebody and they're going to reject us. I'm not going to tell you that that won't happen, because it's possible. I want to tell you about a time it happened to me. I went to an event and I saw this man, also an American, also lives in Prague, a lot longer than I have, even. And he's a minor celebrity. And sometimes he's on Hyde Park and these other shows. And I know about him, but I never met him before. So I thought, OK. I walked up to him and I said, you're somebody that I would love to meet. And I held out my hand. And he said, why? And he didn't hold out his hand. Immediately, I felt like a complete idiot. You know, I'm standing there and I said something stupid like, well, I follow you on Twitter, and it's kind of interesting. <laughs> and he said, I don't really do much on Twitter. And he walked away. And there I'm standing there like a complete jerk. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. I'm not the jerk here. This guy is the jerk. And I turned around, and the first person I saw, I said, hi, I'm Jean, and they were really nice, and it was OK. And I survived. <coughs> Sorry, I have a cold. Um, the point is, it can happen to you. It's happened to me. But in all of the years that I've been talking to strangers, that is the one and only time that has ever happened. And even if it happens to you, it's OK. They're the jerks. Move on. It's probably never going to happen again. Don't let the fear of rejection keep you back from meeting incredible, nice, interesting people. Because that makes for a much richer and much more interesting life. So do it.
Change number two. Envy. Envy is normal. I'm not going to tell you to not envy people because that's absolutely impossible. But what I'm going to tell you is to change your reaction to envy. I think that we have two reactions that we can choose from. The first one involves some kind of unhealthy comparison. I like to use the example of Friends, the show. Everybody knows the story, so there are these interesting, beautiful, talented, loyal friends, and they live in these multi-million dollar apartments in Manhattan. This is never gonna happen to you. I'm sorry, it's never going to happen to you. You might be rich one day, but you're probably not going to have these incredibly talented, interesting, loyal friends. Or you might have the friends, but you're probably not gonna be that rich in Manhattan. When we compare ourselves to this kind of example, we feel like crap. It's never gonna happen. Now you can take this real life example, somebody like Mark Zuckerberg. You're in a startup and this is your idol, man. I mean, you think this is gonna happen to me. It's gonna be like an overnight success. I'm gonna be a multi-billionaire. I just gotta work hard enough. It's probably never going to happen to you. I'm really sorry, okay? So if you compare yourself and it doesn't happen, you feel like shit. You know, that's the result of it. And not only is it that the unhealthy comparison makes you feel bad, unhealthy comparisons also lead to schadenfreude. Schadenfreude is German. The reason I'm using a German word is that this emotion we don't have a word for in English. It doesn't exist. It has a, a meaning in Czech, however, there is a word. Skodolibost. Unhealthy comparisons lead to this feeling. This feeling of something bad happens to somebody else and it makes me feel good. <laughs> Happiness through someone else's misery. This is why magazines like Blesk and all of these tabloids, that's why they sell so well, because we feel good when Jennifer Aniston, she's beautiful, she's rich, she's famous, but she's too old to have children. <laughs> or Demi Moore, she got a younger man, she doesn't look 50, she looks 25, and now she's getting fat. Ha! That makes me feel good. <laughs> this is not healthy. Okay, this is the reaction to envy that's normal. This is the reaction I don't want you to have. There's another way, and it's called keeping up with the Joneses. Jones is a very common name in the United States. And so, Mr. Jones could be my neighbor. We live next door, and so it's not an unhealthy comparison because he's right next door to me, practically the same. But, Mr. Jones, he makes just a little bit more money than I do. He has just a little bit better job. And he's just a little bit fitter than I am. He doesn't have this beer belly, you know. And his children, they go to just a little bit better schools than my children do. So I look at Mr. Jones. Now I could say, Schadenfreude would make me feel better. Mr. Jones's house could burn down and I could feel good about it. But I could go the other way and think, no, wait a minute, I have to do something about this. So I work hard and I get a little bit better job. I start going to the gym and I work out every night and I start getting fitter. I hire a tutor for my children so that they can get to a little bit better school next year. Keeping up with the Joneses is all about me. It's my responsibility. It's not something bad happening to Mr. Jones. It's something that I have to work on. I've got to do something so that I can have a better life. This is the reaction to envy that I would like to see you having now. 
Change number three. You guys, checks, have an amazing talent of finding the negative in just about every situation. I mean, it can be a beautiful day, blue sky, sun is shining, we're on holiday and everything, and I say, so how are you? And you'll say, eh, nothing special. <laughs> and that's like the best reaction that I'll get, you know. <laughs> What I would like to see you do is to start thinking of the positive. Now, I have kind of an advantage because I'm just naturally sunny, positive, optimistic. That's just the way I am. It drives my husband crazy sometimes. And sometimes he's right. You know, sometimes I shouldn't be this optimistic. But I think most of the time I'm right. And I think the reason I'm right is to have different experiences happen to me, I have to try to expect the positive. When you expect the positive to happen, I think it's more likely to happen. I want to show you a couple examples of what I mean by this. The first one has to do with the way that I treat people. I believe in being really, really nice, especially to invisible people. What I mean by invisible people are the ones that we see every day and we don't think that they have much power. They're people like the cashiers at Albert or the receptionists, the secretaries. We see them every day, we walk by them every day, and we don't give them a lot of credit for anything. But I think they have a lot of power. I think they have the power to make our moods. I have a much better day when I have a great interaction with one of these people. I used to work for a bank many years ago, and the bank was near the Florence Metro Station, and I used to be a smoker. So every morning, I would go to this little traffica near the Florence Metro Station, and there was this guy in the traffica, and we just had this really nice connection. And we never said much to each other, but it was always a smile, it was always, have a nice day, and I went every work day to the same traffica to get my cigarettes and my Pepsi. And for three years, we had this great connection. And then my bank moved to a place near Namisti Miru. And from one day to the next, I stopped going to this traffica. And I found some place else to go. About two years after we moved, I found myself at the Florence Metro Station. And I thought, gee, I wonder if that guy's still there. You know, it's been two years. But maybe I'll just stop in and, and see if he's still there. So I walk in, and I see him across the room behind the cash register. He looks up at me. He dropped whatever he had in his hands, runs up to me and says, Gedeste Billa! <laughs> Where have you been? <laughs> Two years, he remembered. And I realized at that moment that this has a lot of power, how you treat people, not just making yourself feel good, but it had a lot of power for him as well. I also believe that people are basically good. And I know that is the exact opposite of most Czech people that I know and they think that people basically have bad intentions and you should be careful. Yes, I've been proven wrong a couple times with my feelings that people are basically good, but I think that acting this way towards people really changes the experiences that you can have. And I want to show you an example. About 1997, uh, I was going to a birthday party for myself with my friends in the city. And we were having a great time, drinking and dancing and eating and staying out till three o'clock in the morning. And I knew that this group of people, taxi drivers, have really, really bad reputation. I knew that they're more likely to rip off foreigners than anyone else, and that I should be careful. But you know, I was having a great night, 
It was three o'clock in the morning. I needed a taxi. So this taxi driver stopped and I said, you know, I knew that I had to negotiate the price first. And we did that. I got in, I lived way out Yezhny Mnesto, so it's like a long ride. I had very limited Czech, he had very limited English, but we had a great conversation all the way home. And I got out at the end, paid, by, and I was hungry. You know, I got my pajamas on and started cooking in the kitchen. About 20 minutes after he left, I heard through the open window, American woman, American woman. It's like, wow, what could that be? So I look out the window and I see the taxi driver holding my camera. He had driven all the way back into the city and then he looked over and he realized that I had left my camera in the car and he drove all the way back to give it back to me. When you start expecting positive things from people, you can have an amazing experience, I think. Change number four. <laughs> Complaining is normal. Yes. And you guys are really, really good at it. <laughs> you take it to a new art form, really. Um, I'm not going to tell you to stop complaining. The thing about it is, though, that you need to do something about what you're complaining about. That's what I don't see. We have a phrase in America, shit or get off the pot. And if you can picture the pot as a toilet, what it means is either you do something about it, or move out of the way so somebody else can do something about it. I would like to see more of this happening. But unfortunately, what I see happening and what I hear is this phrase. No, yo, no, to mom dělat. What can I do about it? What this phrase says to me is, I have no responsibility here. There's nothing that I can do about this. I am powerless in this situation. And I think most of the time this is bullshit. And I would like to see it stop. I would like to show you an example of what I mean. About two years ago, I was at a UX conference and I met this UX designer from Pilsen. And we were talking and he was complaining a lot. He was complaining about the fact that there is no UX community in Pilsen. They have no events, they have no open coffee, they have nothing. And he was complaining. And so I said, well, why don't you start something? Ugh! He had 50 reasons why he should not start something. He has no time, nobody would come, everybody would just complain about it. There's no way that he was going to start this community. So, what I see in every event, I can say without exception, every event that I go to here, there is this general level of complaining, okay? The food sucks, the presenters are awful, the breaks are too short, I don't like the location, there's no parking, they have everything to complain about. What I don't see happening, however, is I don't see people going to the organizers and saying, listen, these are some things that's wrong. I would like you to actually go one step further beyond just talking to the organizers. I would like to see you doing something about it. Say to the organizer, listen, these three things, they gotta change. Listen, I have time, I can help you out. I can do this. Or I know somebody who can help you out. Or here's some suggestions, I have some ideas. This is what needs to happen, and let me tell you why this needs to happen. This community of people that go to events like today, that go to UX camp, that go to hackathons, that go to startup weekends, this community in this country is extremely young. It's 
developing. The only way that it's going to develop further is if we stop this complaining, 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 and we start doing something. Because when you think about it, the people that organize these events, they're all volunteers. They're not doing this for money. They're doing this in their free time. And they're going to start reacting like this UX guy in Pilsen, and they're going to say, no way. I'm out. I'm not doing it anymore. People only complain. And that will make this community that is just starting, starting to be vibrant, starting to be great, it will make it suffer and die. So please, the next time you feel like complaining, wonderful. But complain to the organizers. Give them ideas. Tell them that you can be part of the solution to this. Be a part of the development. If you can't think of anything that you can do, or if you just, you have no idea how it could be better, please just do this. There are four changes I would like you to make starting now. The first one involves every event that you go to. Say to yourself, I'm going to meet three new people before I go and hang out with my friends. I'm going to meet three new people before I go home. I want you to start tonight at the after party, okay? And you know, most of you I don't know. So you know you can come to me, I won't reject you. Okay? <laughs> Number two, don't get caught in the trap of schadenfreude, of skodolibos. Don't get caught in that trap. Start looking at yourself in the mirror. Start saying, how can I make my life better so that I don't feel this envy so much? Work on yourself. Number three, when you start to expect positive things to happen with people and with situations, you can have amazing experiences. Try it. And the last one, I want you to think right now, think about something that really pisses you off and figure out how you can change it. If you can't think of any way, just stop complaining. Yeah? If you ask a two-year-old, are you normal? She won't really know what to say to you because she doesn't really know the rules of what's normal and what isn't normal. And she doesn't care. She's just doing her own thing, having her own time. Can we start getting back to that feeling and not worrying so much about being normal or not? Because if we think about it, we have a really, really long time to be exactly like everybody else around us. Let's use the time that we have to work on being exceptional. Thanks. <laughs>